Welcome to the Business Finishing School Podcast, the Financial Battleship Edition. Learn how to regain liquidity, use, and control of your cash while harnessing the power of uninterrupted compounding. Become a wealth creator. Here's your host, President and CEO of Living Wealthy Financial, Teresa Kuhn. Welcome. This is Teresa Kuhn with my partner, Rick Sapio. And today's podcast is on why investors are horrible investors. I know that sounds somewhat duplicative, right? But it's actually one of Rick Sapio's favorite quotes. People are horrible investors. And so, Rick, you're going to take this one and you're going to tell us why you've just offended 99% of the people out there who think they're great investors. Yeah, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. It's why I started a business that was a mutual fund superstore in the 90s, which we got over $2 billion in assets. People were able to buy and sell any mutual fund. What we saw, which really broke our heart, was people would buy stocks and obviously mutual funds at an absolute high. They would look at what fund did really hot last year, what fund had five stars on a Morningstar rating, what fund was up double-digit returns, and they would buy that fund. And not everybody would do this, but in general. And what we saw over and over is people would buy high. And then when that asset went down in value, they would sell. So they would buy high and sell low. They would buy at the top of the market and sell at the bottom of the market. But one of the age old rules of investing is what? That's a question for the audience and for you, Teresa. So one of the age old rules of investing is to buy low, sell high. Absolutely. But what do people do? They buy high. When people shop for homes in general, they look for neighborhoods that have already appreciated. Let's buy this home, honey, because it's up 50% in the last five years. Instead of buying at the bottom in neighborhoods that have not yet appreciated. So the reason that we started this podcast and the reason we started the 100 year saving solution is because we know human nature. Teresa and I have had tens of thousands of clients cumulatively. We've also talked to many CPAs over the years and we know that investors have a hard time telling the truth about themselves and about their investment results. But when you talk to CPAs, all of us listening to this podcast, I don't know how many people are listening to it, but go call your CPA friends and say, how do investors do in general? And CPAs, for the most part, will say, horrible. That's why the quote for this podcast is, investors do horrible in the markets. And they do. So here's the solution to that. The solution to that is a 100-year savings solution. What is it? It is a fixed return product. You know what you're going to get every year. It's tax advantaged. It's been paying dividends and interest going back to the Civil War. This product has been paying interest and dividends all the way back to the Civil War. So it's proven. And what it does is something that we're trying to get all of you to embrace. It does it using simplicity, probability, and leverage, thereby enabling you to focus on your career and focus on your family and focus on bettering yourself as opposed to stressing out about the markets, trading, buying, selling, et cetera. I have had friends that have called me and said, I just want to kiss you, Rick. I said, why? And they said, because five years ago, you told me to buy into this product. And when COVID hit and the market dropped 30%, it was the only thing I owned that went up in value. And that's what this is about. It's about relieving you of all that stress. So Teresa, in preparation for this call, we've done a little bit of research. Why don't you ask me the questions about the research? Because it is staggering. It is staggering, and it's our passion to educate people on actual investor return. It sounds somewhat self-serving, but in reality, Rick, we got into this 100-year savings solution as a result of our experience with human nature and how people invest. It wasn't an afterthought. It was the thought because we understand human nature. And before you get into that information, why don't you talk about human nature? And why don't you talk about the connection between how people invest and how people gamble and how the two are connected? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. So I watched Tesla stock over the last year. And I remember a year ago, sitting down with a friend of mine who's a very knowledgeable investor. And he said, short Tesla stock. 
And I said, well, why should I short Tesla? And he said, well, the balance sheet is upside down. They're not profitable. They can't get you know, products out the door from an operations perspective. And then over the next 12 months, the stock was up 10 times. And the reason is because people buy on emotion. People don't buy on reality. And so how are you and I as investors supposed to predict buying stocks? What people's emotions are going to say? Sure, Tesla should have probably gone out of business, but for the emotions that investors fuel that stock with, which enable the company to actually borrow more money and survive. But the connection between emotions and investors is a very simple one. It plays into greed. And greed forces us as human beings to not be able to tell the truth. Let me give you an example about that. So we had this mutual fund superstore. We had over $2 billion in assets. We had thousands of clients. And as a result of watching how horribly they did, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, et cetera, we created a, our own mutual funds. And we said to our investors, we said, look, we would go to random investors with our telemarketing center and say, Mr. Investor, we're looking at your portfolio and you were down 30% last year. We have a portfolio that we manage, we'll manage it for you. And that portfolio was up 9% last year. Why don't you move to our portfolio, which the 9% was after all fees. And the investor would say, I wasn't down 30%. What are you talking about? I just bought a fund last week that was up last year. So we have a hard time admitting the reality that were horrible investors, mainly because of greed, but there's also the component of pride. And I don't know why that happens, but you could literally show an investor their portfolio, show that they were down, and they absolutely positively can't admit it. Now, if this happened once, okay, you could dismiss it. This happened thousands and thousands of times, so much so that I decided to get out of that business because I am passionate about people making money, not losing money. So I had to just get out of it. Regarding like the Tesla phenomenon, the actual balance sheet and the actual numbers would have suggested that Tesla was going out of business. But because of the market sentiment, Tesla actually went up. It went up 10 times. What about the institutional investors that invested in Tesla? How did they end up doing? And how did they manage those kind of investments when just the typical investor cannot? So let me get to the point of all of that. So even though I said in Tesla went up 10 times, the average investor didn't make money on Tesla because they tend to buy high and when it drops, they sell out. The institutional investors have an advantage, however. For the most part, they're buy and hold. So they'll ride it through and they'll put hedging instruments underneath the stock. So as it goes up, if the stock happens to drop, it'll automatically sell them out. So they've got advantages that individual investors don't have. So I could explain all that, which is very complicated, but it's irrelevant at the end of the day. The finance part needs to be two components. One, invest your money very safely with compounding interest over time, you're going to do fine. And also invest your money. The other half, we call it the barbell investment strategy. The other part of the barbell is investing in your business, in yourself, in whatever it is that you're great at, that you can make money on your career. And in the middle, you know, a barbell's got heavy <laughs> weights on both sides. So you got your safe money, which is a large portion of your portfolio. A lot of it for me is in my 11 policies in a whole life policy that are interest paying, and that have paid for a long time. So you got your safe money, you've got your risk money, but that's risk of you. That's a small business you start, that's betting on businesses that you're related to, you know very well that you could buy the stocks of. And the middle is maximizing your IRA and 401ks and those types of assets. So that's the nirvana. But let me go to something that will really hammer this point home. So Peter Lynch is a very famous portfolio manager. In fact, he ran the portfolio of the mutual fund called the Fidelity Magellan Fund. And he ran that fund for 13 years from 1977 to 1990. You probably know the answer, but many people won't know the answer. Why was he so celebrated for running the Fidelity Magellan Fund? And I'm asking it from this perspective, Teresa, do you know how much the average annual return of that fund was when Peter Lynch ran it? over 13 years. What was the average annual return? I actually know because I studied Peter Lynch and I talk about Peter Lynch when I talk with clients and train other advisors. I believe it was about 29%. 29% per year. Unbelievable. So Fidelity is using that to market it everywhere. They're marketing their fund. We were up 29% a year. What do you think the average investor 
that owned that fund during that period of time, at any point during that period of time, they could have owned it the whole time or they could have gotten in and out. What did the average investor make in Fidelity during that 13 year period in which the fund was up 29% per year? I don't know that I remember the exact number, but I know it was in the single digits, which to people is gonna be unbelievable. They should look this up, but single digits. Yep. So here's the answer. Because people had a propensity to buy when the market was up and when the fund was up and sell when it was down or sell at the wrong time or sell when their spouse is nervous, depending on what study you look at, and Fidelity has done many studies on it, the average investor's return was somewhere between zero and 2.9%. Zero and 2.9%. Now, this should be absolutely shocking. It should also be criminal. Why should it be criminal? Because Every ad on TV tells you that you could invest yourself. And the reality is you cannot. It's not worth it. What's worth it is focusing on what you're good at, which is your career, and focusing on having things compound over time slowly with absolute certainty, with guarantees and all of that. That's what we should be doing. So, Rick, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment because I know what the audience is thinking. I hear this all the time. Well, my father invested in the market and he did great. My friend Jim invests in the market and he does great. He's teaching me how to invest in the market. Like there are lots of people who can make money in the market, Teresa. There absolutely are. There is a certain breed of individuals and I know many of them and they are professionals. They don't say they're professionals, but they are. They know how to buy and hold for the long haul. They know how to study businesses and funds. That is a very tiny percentage of the marketplace. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that with another stat. There is a company called Dalbar. I think their website is dalbar.com. Dalbar analyzes investor behavior and returns. They've been doing it for many, many decades. I think about 60 years. I could be wrong. And they look at tens of thousands of statements of clients trading. And what they have found over the entire history of their research is that the average investor does less than 4% per year on average. And when you subtract taxes, it's horrible. It's what, two and a half percent. I don't even know if that beats T-bills. It certainly doesn't beat the long-term rate of CDs. But here's the point. Getting that two and a half percent after tax was done with a lot of stress and a lot of aggravation and a lot of losses and a lot of pain. And that's what we're trying to relieve you of. So when you subtract to your point, from that average of less than 4% pre-tax, when you subtract the really good investors and you pull those off the top, the average investor is about one to one and a half percent a year. It is shocking. Now, people have a hard time admitting that. So here's what we like to do. And we want all the people that think they're great at investing to keep doing what you're doing. We want the small percentage of you that are listening, the small percentage that says, you know what? You're right. I'm sick of this game. I don't trust Wall Street. I don't trust the nonsense. I want to go with a top rated insurance company that's been around for more than 100 years, that's never missed a dividend, that's never missed a payment. I want to buy that product because you got me. You're right. I'm going to focus on saving for the long term, building my legacy creating a strategy with my family to build wealth long term. And I'm going to do that for the majority of my money. The rest, I'm going to focus on my business. And my business pays the bills. It also is an opportunity for me to create more money in a predictable way that I could then reinvest in policies like this. And we've talked about Nelson Nash, who had over 80 policies. I know you have many policies. I have 11, et cetera. But the point is, we're trying to pull out of the United States those people that get it. And the people that say, no, 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 you're wrong. I know what I'm doing. You know, the pride <laughs> that they can't ever get out of the way. You know, keep doing what you're doing and talk to your CPA and ask your CPA how you're doing. Rick, I do have clients that invest and supposedly they do well. They still have policies. And the reason is, is that they've realized it makes them better investors. You know, when you look at retirement planning, to speak of. They have a portfolio that includes their investments in Wall Street, and they've got an investment that gives them a paycheck for life, and they've got their policies. And when the market goes down or the market's not performing, they have their policy as their backup plan so that they don't have to tap into their retirement plan to take out money when the market's going down. So there's a very real phenomenon, very real risk called the sequence of return. And that risk is present when you are paying for retirement from your investment funds. And when you start tapping into your investment funds to pay for your retirement, if the market is going down, the chances, the probability 
that you will outlive your money goes up drastically. But if you've got a policy in place and the market goes down, what do you do? You have a backup plan. You tap into your policy and allow the market to do what it does best. Eventually, the markets will go up. And so you didn't sell low. You stayed in the market and you became a better investor. And your probability of not running out of money just went down drastically. Yep. And what you're describing in the scenario you just laid out is the barbell investment strategy. So a barbell has a lot of weight on one end and a lot of weight on the other. And the way we have this laid out in the diagram is if you've got your safe money on one end of your barbell, just imagine a barbell in a gym with heavy weights on each end. So you've got your safe money on one end, you've got your risk money on the other. Ideally, it's risk money in businesses that you know extremely well. And I would argue that there are investors that are good investors because they know very well what they're doing. They're long-term buy and hold. They're very competent in it. So I would argue that they're doing what you just described as somebody using the barbell investment strategy. I would also argue that they're probably maximizing their 401ks and their IRAs and all of that as well. So come retirement, they now have certain pools of assets. They've got their safe money. They've got their risk money. And to your point, you don't want to start tapping or using your risk money when the market's down because you'd be selling low. So I like that analogy and you're 100% right. Most people don't have that luxury yet. So my point in summarizing all of this is I believe unless you have a massive amount of money in your safe money, you're truly not wealthy. Because that safe money strategy is your real wealth. If another virus hits or the market goes to hell in a handbasket or whatever, you've got your safe money there. However, your risk money is going to drop in value dramatically. So I tell investors, save 500000 in this safe money strategy using whole life insurance policies. Once you have 500000 cash value, then start thinking about risk. And it's hard for people to grasp, but hundreds and thousands of people that have listened to us on this, they're in a much, much different place mentally, spiritually, emotionally than everybody else. This is a much bigger conversation than just finance and money. There have been years when the market has been down, when real estate has been down. Rick, you know this, the amount of mental, spiritual, emotional anguish and depression that sets in the shame when people lose money is much greater than the balance sheet going down in value from year to year. Yeah, great topic. I feel bad because I'm trying to convince people using logic when they are emotionally hooked in to fear, greed, and pride. But for those of you that can push fear, greed, and pride aside, go to the website and schedule an appointment www.100yearsavingsolution.com. And with that, Teresa, thank you so much for another provocative topic. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Business Finishing School podcast, where we teach you business growth simplified. For more information on Business Finishing School or their Business Growth Summit event, visit businessfinishingschool.com.